Music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. My guest today is William Mayer, and William Mayer is one of the important composers of our time. He lives in New York. Indeed, he was born in New York in 1925, and your career has been, to say the least, wide-ranging. How are you? Good shape, David. Very good. Now, you're a man, I was going to have a long introduction about all of your works and the grants and the professorships and so forth, but that will be boring, because as a man, you are not boring. You have that thing called enthusiasm, and your music is enthusiastic often. It's often lyrical. Once you explained it as lontano, what does that mean exactly? That's one part of your music. Well, I'm not quite sure if I'm afraid of the present, but I've always loved the past, mm -hmm. and I love great spaces. And I once wrote a selection looking out from my studio in Vermont. By the way, I'm now a Vermont resident. Mm -hmm. uh, and looking at the stars and so forth, and decided that we're all rather small, both in terms of time and space. So that has always fascinated me. And I did write a rather large number for uh, Robert de Cormier, the New York Choral Society, that said spring came on forever, a uh, kind of dedication to lovers of the past. But I've always loved that kind of uh, feeling of great distance. And you love much music. You're not only, as they say, into your own music. You've been... The word is not influenced. You've been in love with the works of Bartok and Stravinsky, our own American Samuel Barber, and show music. You have, mm -hmm. you have composed wonderful popular works, and you certainly don't condemn them. Well, actually, I got into ASCAP by writing a thing called Bongo and His Baboon Drum for Burl Ives. Unfortunately, his tempo is exactly one-third of the normal tempo, but it was quite popular, <laughs> considerably more popular than most of my serious works. Uh, well, that, that's uh, something that one has to contend with in the world of serious, quote-unquote, serious composers. Which is a terrible word. Cause now, it, you are... You are, though, deeply involved in the dissemination of contemporary music. You are, what is it, the chairman or whatever? Well, I'm, yes, I'm chairman of the board of CRI, and I suppose I should have a long white beard to be chairman of the board. Yes. But this is a wonderful label, which kind of preserves the American past yes, and, does. Dis and really discovers the American future. And in a sense, we're a little bit like Noah's Ark, because uh, we do preserve all kinds of species. We never delete Mm -hmm. uh, unlike uh, the record companies. And, this, is, uh, this is why it's always growing in a way. There is no there is no out-of-print CRI, is there? Uh, nothing's out of print, it's no. Wonderful. Unfortunately, that means our budget is growing all the time because we, we're stuck, uh, how to say it, with the turkeys as well as the swans. The turkeys meaning the things that are not selling as good. Is that uh, that's right, right. Yeah. yes. But it's a, a marvelous label, and I think it's very important for composers, especially because they're played uh, on your station and many others. Uh, so it's not a question of just buying the records, but getting that, that very special air exposure that I'm getting right now. Yes, certainly CRI has made an important place in the record industry and certainly in American music. Now, mostly it is American composers, right? That's right, but we're broadening out, and uh, it's because so many other countries do so much more for their composers, so in a sense we feel that we have to do something for ours. Uh -huh. How are musical pieces chosen for recording? That's an interesting subject. Well, we have a uh, editorial committee, but actually it's the whole board that uh, chooses the work, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Our board is made up primarily of composers, and uh, actually we get along rather well, which is uh, <laughs> uh, quite surprising. So that we have a lot of professional expertise there, and we keep switching the committees around so that uh, mm -hmm. I always say, if you get rejected, come on back two years later. So in a sense then, Bill... The composer finally gets his say, and that's not uh, a simple matter in this society, is it? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean when you say he gets his say. Does that mean it doesn't well, necessarily mean that he'll end up on CRI? I no, yeah. of course not, but I think <clears throat> that a composer is, in a way, especially today, 
a second-class citizen compared to the performer, the interpreter who continues the life of Beethoven and Brahms. It's not yes. easy to get performances of your it music. It certainly isn't. It's a little bit like when you go to a restaurant and you thank the waiter and so forth, and of course the great creator is inside, and, and uh, you don't see the chef very often, and I always feel there's a, there's a real parallel there. It's wonderful. Uh, someone said that a composer really doesn't feel that he exists uh, in this country unless he's recorded. It's a little bit like looking in the mirror and saying, hey, I'm alive. Mm -hmm. This was said by Professor Joe Macklis, mm -hmm. uh, who teaches at Queens. In a sense, having a recording means that he can actually make real the music for his class. And it's the difference between program notes and the real thing, or, or looking at a menu and reading about a steak and deciding to take a good bite. So I think recordings are essential. Oh, and they're fascinating because we will be able to take a real bite of that cake, so to speak, in one of your earliest works, something you still very much like. Many composers don't like their early works, mm. not you. Well, I suppose I'm rather nostalgic about this particular work. This was a work that I composed when I was finishing up Manus College. I was older than most students because I had been in the Army in the mm -hmm. Counterintelligence Corps. It's a six-minute work. It used to be the slow movement of a string quartet, so it sounds very reminiscent of the famous Adagio by Sam Barber. I do call it Andante, but it is a little slower than the usual Andante. That's because Adagio had already been taken. And I was going to say one lovely thing, and that is that it had been programmed here a few times on WNCN, and I got a lovely fan letter from an unknown person saying, thank you very much, you have brought back a piece of my heart. And that was just about the nicest fan letter I've ever gotten, so I decided uh, this would be good to start off with. Oh, it's wonderful. The Andante for Strings by my guest composer William Mayer, and the performance? It's uh, Skrovachevsky yes. of the Minnesota Orchestra performing the work. Here we go, on Dante for Strings.
That was Skrovachevsky, the Minneapolis, or is it called the Minnesota? They now call it the Minnesota Orchestra. Orchestra, yes. It used yes. to be the Minneapolis. Yes, when, with Dimitri Metropolis then, right? Right. Okay. Now, that was a work by William Mayer, my guest today, who just was speaking, if you just tuned in, and we heard his very beautiful Andante for Strings, composed 28 years ago and finished off, as I found out, during a skiing trip, right? <laughs> That's right, yes. Well, it's not an icy work by any means. It's a hot work. <laughs> <laughs> After this message, we'll be back with more conversation and music by the American composer, now Vermont resident, William Mayer. Bill Mayer is my guest. We talked about CRI. If anyone doesn't know that label, it is in a very important label disseminating contemporary music. That is the lyrical William Mayer. What about another aspect of your music? You have in some of your music a rhythmical drive. In other pieces I have heard a kind of, well, almost a, a euphoric kind of joy. Well, I used to feel it was almost illegal a number of years ago, to be that joyful uh, in our world, uh, particularly in the world of music. There seemed to be a great premium on anxiety. <laughs> but um, <That's> so true. <laughs> I think things really have changed. When we think of Charles Ives' music and so forth, I think that one really can possibly be profound and, and joyful at the same time. Well, things have changed, Bill, because you see, 25, 30 years ago, a composer who wrote a lyrical effusion like the Andante for Strings would have been made to feel bad, not only by his colleagues, but by all sorts of pressures saying that this is not modern music. So yes, I, yes. I think this very program that we have, we'll have a Toccata by years, we'll have your little micro opera, will show the ability now of a composer to really be himself. I think that's the important thing. In the old days, I'm, I would say maybe 15, 20 years ago, if an audience liked uh, a work, sometimes you might think about rewriting it, <laughs> <laughs> which it was very dangerous. Yes, but you, <laughs> might, you might then have been termed a romantic composer. You would have secretly loved that, but you would have said, oh, my goodness, this is, <laughs> this is not. <laughs> but I, I think that one thing I can say is I have uh, stuck to my guns and just have written this. You know, if you feel in, in a very romantic mood and so forth, one writes that way. Mm -hmm. I do have a, a strong strong rhythmic uh, impulse, too, and I, I think that, as a matter of fact, quite aside from our normal heartbeats and so forth, this is part of life. I'm never quite sure what's coming up next, and the important thing is hopefully to realize an idea and, and not have any preconceptions. Uh, so often, later on in, in the program, you'll hear a piece in which I thought would turn out one way. Well, I think you've just got to let yourself go and sometimes follow the impulse and, and be a surprise, possibly, as the audience might be, where it's mm -hmm. going to go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think you can get very, very strange juxtapositions that are honestly make sense inside. And I, I would say that in that sense, it's kind of a somewhat like a dream. Our dreams seem wild mm -hmm. and unrelated on the surface. But uh, if you've spent any time being a, a patient or just reading Freud and what have you, I think there's subtle connections inside. And so I think w when we write, we just try to be as free as we can and not stop the wildest juxtapositions from taking place with the thought that they must have sprung from somewheres and there must be hidden connections like there are in dreams. So you're not doctrinaire in any way. You have a free use of compositional techniques all the time. Yeah, I would hope so. I've written some very dissonant works. I always feel that it's awfully important just to let the idea take you where, where it uh -huh. wants to go. Bill, tell me now. We have another work that's coming up, and we have a lot of pieces on this program. I'm delighted. What is Khartoum? Tell me of that connection. Well, first of all, I've always loved the word Khartoum. I love the spelling, K-H-A-R-T-O-U-M, which is so wildly unusual. Is it a place? It's a place in Africa, and uh, it always sounded romantic to me until a friend of mine told me that she went there and found it a most depressing town. But thank heavens I had written this particular <laughs> t song before I'd gotten there. So it's, once again, it's, it, a little bit of knowledge is all right, but perhaps too much knowledge is very dangerous. This particular work is very sultry. It's a love song about your heart being with your lover. But the problem is that this lover has disappeared. So in a sense, one's heart has disappeared too. Mm. I didn't confess to writing the words until a few years ago, but I did. You wrote the words. Uh, I wrote the, wrote the words. I, I did. And it's a, a short work. Uh, it's sung by Catherine Rowe, a, a wonderful singer. And the ensemble is Arthur Weisberg's. Aha. Uh -huh. And now let's hear William Mayer's Khartoum. <laughs>
he is. That was William Mayer's Khartoum, a song that he wrote not only the music but the words. And after this message, we will be back with more conversation with my guest, the American composer William Mayer. This is David Dubal, and we are back. This program dedicated to the music of William Mayer, and he is with me. We just heard a, your song, Khartoum. Let's continue in, in the realm of this American art song, I would suppose it's called. Sounds very fancy, David. <laughs> I never knew what an art song was. <clears throat> We're going to hear two more, and you talk about them, The Flight and Flotsam. Well, these are two songs, a part of a piece written for the Ariel Ensemble, a most unusual ensemble. Jerry Bunky. That's right, who plays, that, the, yes. plays the clarinet. He was on this program once. right Oh, And I, Julia Lovett is mm -hmm. a soprano, and Michael Fardink is the pianist. Yes. And these are two of six songs. I particularly like to read the words of the very last song. It's by Langston Hughes, and this is the last poem mm -hmm. he ever wrote. As a matter of fact, it was published after he died. And the words go as follows. On the shoals of nowhere cast up my boat, bow all broken, no longer afloat. On the shoals of nowhere wasted my song yet taken by the sea wind and blown along. Uh, I've always felt that was such a, a, a beautiful statement for, for any artist hoping that his song will be heard after he's no longer here. Beautiful. Now, we'll hear that and then... No, actually, the first song is uh, a setting of Sarah Teasdale's mm -hmm. The Flight. Okay. And then the second song is the one that you just heard the words of. Okay. Let us hear them. Who are the performers here? The same as mentioned, okay. Jerry Bunky, Michael Fardink, and Julia Lovett. Here we are. Oh, oh. 
absolutely beautiful. William Mayer's songs, The Flight and Flotsam. Who are the performers? Jerry Bunky, uh -huh. Julia Lovett, the soprano, and Michael Fardink, the pianist. And they make up the ensemble uh, the, the, calls. Um, the Ariel. Ariel Ensemble, yes. Very sensitive performance. I thought so, too. At this I, moment in your life, you are really working hard, I would say. Well, I should be. <laughs> You're not? <laughs> One likes to keep up a front. No, I, I have been. Uh, I will be having an opera based on James Agee's The Death in the Family and also Tad Moselle's All the Way Home, done by the Minnesota Opera, the, the end of May. Wonderful. And it is tough to get a new opera launched, and mm -hmm. some people say it's a little bit like a battleship. Mm -hmm. We're excited. We hope that the hull won't turn up <laughs> after the launching. <laughs> but uh, it's a wonderful group out there. And uh, I thought it might be interesting just to play you a few selections. I should say that the accompaniment right now is just piano, mm -hmm. but uh, I think you'll get an idea, despite the, uh, the fact that it's not orchestra. So this, who, who did the libretto? I did the libretto, as a so matter you're of fact. So you're a writer of English words a lot, aren't you? Well, I do some writing, and some of you may remember a number of years ago I did an article for the Times magazine called Live Composers, Dead Audiences. And we got an awful lot of response from the audiences who were not particularly pleased. Uh -huh. Well, I hope they are pleased with your opera, Death in the Family, and we were going to hear about five minutes' worth, right? That's right. Who sings this? Well, now, to start off with, we have the um, uh, Hallelujah, which is really um, in terms of a little boy uh, thinking about a Hallelujah feeling because he's allowed to get a very large outlandish cap which means he'll really be as macho as the other boys. This is done by the occasional singers. The conductor is Gil Robbins. Then the next selection is based on a beautiful line by James A.G., Who Shall Tell the Sorrow of Being on This Earth? It's after the family find out that the hero has been killed in a car accident. For our singers, we have Richard Fritch, Larry Glenn, Judith Christian, Lucy Shelton, who has just recently sung here in New York, Ruth Ray, and Catherine Rowe. And my son, Stephen Mayer, is doing the piano part. And let's hear scenes from your upcoming opera to be done in Minnesota, Death in the Family by William Mayer. I should say one last thing, David. I forgot yeah. to mention the very last episode, which is about a butterfly done by Gil Robbins. The little boy has lost his father, and they're describing the funeral to him, and uh, after the coffin is lowered down, suddenly the sun comes out, and a butterfly flies up straight into the sky, higher and higher until it disappears. And I always felt that was a very beautiful image for a little boy. Is this a big opera of yours? It's, it it's a large opera. Uh -huh. It's three acts. I would say it's probably the most... Can you say the most major work one has done? If there is such a word, I would say that this is it. Okay, here it is, Death in the Family, William Mayer's opera.
Rufus. If anything ever does make me believe in life after death, it'll be what happened this afternoon in Greenwood Cemetery. There were a lot of clouds, but they were blowing fast, so there was lots of sunshine, too. Right when they began to lower your father into the ground, into his grave, a cloud came over and there was a shadow like iron and a perfectly magnificent butterfly settled on the coffin, just rested there, right over the breast and stayed there, barely making his wings breathe like the heart. I stayed there all the way down, Rufus, till the coffin grated against the bottom like a rowboat. And just when it did, well, the sun came out just dazzling bright. And he flew up and out of that hole in the ground, straight up into the sky, so high, I couldn't even see him anymore. Marvelous scenes from William Mayer's new opera, Death in the Family, to be performed in May in Minnesota. That's right, by the, the Minnesota Opera Company. This indeed will be something for us in New York to look forward to hearing. It just sounds beautiful, Bill. Well, thanks a lot, David. I it, wish you it, the best of luck with this. An opera is its like a, a, a family. It really is. I hope it won't be a death in the family. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I think my wife might <laughs> have other thoughts about that. On that note, <laughs> we must pause for one message or possibly two, and we'll be back with more music by my guest, William Mayer. There is another work, very different. We just heard Death in the Family scenes from your the future production, and there is now coming up a micro opera. Talk to me of this. Well, this, I believe, is the shortest three act opera in the world. It takes six minutes. <laughs> the libretto is by a wonderful man, Milton Feist. Uh, actually, he is no longer with us. He was a rabbi, but had a marvelous sense of humor. Actually, I think this is one of the most wicked works I've ever written, because uh, I can tell you the whole text in possibly 20 seconds. Let's time it. For the first act, isn't she the cutest baby? You see a meme lying down. Then she uh, stands up. The next act, I never saw a lovelier bride. And then, I'm sorry to say, she's lying down again, and the line is, poor dear, but doesn't she look natural? And finally, we have a 10-second extra in which babyhood, marriage, and death are all combined. All I can say is that it is a rather, uh, how would you say, sardonic work. Uh, story, quite a chaser after the uh, death in the family you just heard. The story took 27 seconds explanation for the uh, libretto. All Too right. long, David. <laughs> Tell me uh, who performs in this micro-opera. Uh, the uh, conductor is Nicholas Harshani. And in a sense, it really is an opera for a chorus. Actually, there are fine members that I recruited from all over New York. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Brief opera. Brief candle. Brief candle and brief opera. And brief opera. Micro opera by William Mayer. Isn't she?
Brief Candle, you have just heard the micro-opera in three acts by William Mayer, and it is totally effective, Bill. Well, well, thank you. As it's I said, it is rather a wicked work. It's, <laughs> it's just wonderful. Tell me the cast again. Well, Janice Harshani is the main soloist. Excellent. And her Does husband, Nicholas flair. Harshani, mm-hmm. is the conductor. Now, we're going to another work, obviously, the American in you, Appalachian Echoes. What's this from, a sweet This is a work from uh, Dream's End. I always like the title very much. It's really a a memorial work for a young relative who who died all too soon. There's a lot of humor in the work, as a matter of fact, but uh, someone said that humor, in a sense, is a way of facing the the harder aspects of our existence. Mm -hmm. But this particular movement, uh, Appalachian Echoes, is really, you might say, the heart of the memorial work. And it's a new recording on the CRI label. It's a St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, and William McLaughlin is the conductor. It's for six instruments, and that's about it. William Mayer's Appalachian Echoes. You have heard William Mayer's Appalachian Echoes. Let's continue talking, Bill, about 
the state of the art. I don't mean phonograph records. I mean, how is contemporary music doing with audiences? You said something about a rather controversial article you wrote once. Well, contemporary music has had real problems in this country. I think you realize if you buy a, a painting and so forth, just from the price, you realize how well the visual arts are doing. You hear a lot about ballet, and one problem that contemporary music has, all music has, is in our television-oriented world, you can't see it. You do see an orchestra and so forth, but sometimes the photography looks a little desperate. It also takes longer, I think, to appreciate a piece of music. Uh, I think that even the finest movies, it's rather rare for us to go more than two or three times. But when it comes to a piece of music, uh, obviously something we like, we might want to hear a hundred times. So it takes longer to get into. This is the nature of music, and particularly with contemporary music, the new sounds, the new structures and so forth are, are sometimes rather difficult for an audience to grab hold of. It helps very much in a program like this. I mean, you hear a, a human composer, we're alive, but, uh, <laughs> and so forth, and that does help. But also, I think the art has to be blamed itself, uh, David. I think for a while that we were writing rather sterile music. I think it was a type of music we were getting from Europe. I have no qualms with very dissonant music, and some of my pieces are, are dissonant. But this seemed to me a little bit too intellectualized. I think that the trouble with the 12-tone system was that people were really at times writing by formula rather than from impulse. Uh, and I think this is all changing. I think a wonderful ferment in, in the 50s and 60s was the new tone colors and the timbres yes. uh, that we're getting. And certainly this is partly true of electronic music, but also you take a composer like George Crumb, uh, who has a whole new spectrum and palette. And these are all fine signs. And also, I, I think that perhaps the audiences have noticed that uh, uh, many of the most avant-garde composers are going back and writing uh, recognizable tunes. That's right. People are loosening up. So I think that par part of the controversy in my article in The Times is not so true today and partly, I think that we can uh, be grateful to television for using very good contemporary music in the background. Now, we're going to conclude our program with a performance by your son, who is a tremendous pianist. His name is Stephen uh, Mayer. Uh, Stephen Mayer is a very fine pianist. Unlike his father, I've kept my distance from the keyboard. And Stephen recently came back from Holland, where he played with the Hague Orchestra. But this particular piece is a work of mine entitled Toccata, which he did down at the Kennedy Center uh, as a celebration of Vermont. This was uh, a state's day, and Vermont had its innings down there. This is, as a matter of fact, the, the first time it has been uh, played on the air, I believe. Great. Then we have a New York premiere, and certainly a WNCN premiere with Stephen Mayer playing William Mayer's Toccata for Piano.
by performance at Kennedy Center, right? At Kennedy Center, yes. Of your Toccata for Piano, and my guest, the composer, William Mayer. Your son is a fabulous pianist, and that was Stephen Mayer playing your Toccata. We have to run now, Bill. I want you so much to come back. I just love your music, and I want to talk more about the state of the art. It's been a great pleasure, David. Thanks, Bill. And this is David Dubal, and thank you for listening. For the Love of Music, with today's host, David Dubal, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when, once again, we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company.